Hello friends. It's Steve from Southern Illinois again. It's been a good week. We've had some rain, we've had some sunshine, we've had some warm weather, we've had some cool weather, but it's been a good week. If you're down in the pit of darkness that we call depression or anxiety, I've got another rope to, sh to throw to you. And understand, these ropes aren't for you to tie around yourself and me pull you up like a sack of potatoes. No, these are ropes for you to use. One day in 1999, I was reading a religious magazine. It was a magazine full of stories about missionaries. Now, if you're a church, if you're church folks, then you understand what I'm saying, okay? Missionaries do things like paddle canoes. They, they live in mud huts or on thatch-roofed houses on, that are built up on stilts. They walk for hours on mountain trails back into remote villages to live and, and minister. And you have to understand that this was the life that I imagined for myself growing up. I didn't grow up in the American culture. I, I was a third culture kid. My childhood was spent with the Navajos on the reservation in New Mexico. I found out I was a white boy when I turned 10 when we moved to Kansas. And shortly after that we moved to Jamaica, which was a whole different experience. So I was born and bred to be a missionary. When I went to medical school, that's what I trained for. I, um, that's what I envisioned. But instead, I ended up here in Southern Illinois. So when I read magazines like this, there's this sense of nostalgia of what my life could have been. So I was reading along in this magazine and um, my eyes kind of drifted up to the corner and there was this cut out map of Africa and all of a sudden BAM like a like an inaudible voice a, a bolt of lightning I had this sudden formed thought you're gonna get a call to this spot on the map <laughs> and I just kinda laughed you know what do you do with experiences like this now you religious folks, you say, ah, oh, God spoke to you. Maybe. You spiritual but not religious folks say, <laughs> the chili from last night's still turning in your stomach, Steve. Don't let these impressions lead you astray. Could be. Well, I'll tell you what I did. I laughed and I said, God, don't tease me. <laughs> you know? By this time, I was really busy. I was working as hard as I could imagine working and doing something that was meaningful to me, serving people. I didn't need to be distracted with dreams and fantasies and nostalgia or these impressions. So I just told God, you know, don't tease me. And that was it nothing else. No bolt of lightning hit me for being disrespectful. Days, weeks, months passed and the alumni journal from my medical school showed up on my desk and I was flipping through it looking to see if I could find any articles about by friends or that talked about people I knew when all of a sudden I stumbled across this this uh, headline, this title spread across two pages that said come over to Nigeria and help us. And I thought, hey, that's a cute play on words, you know, Paul's vision of come over to Macedonia and help us. And then all of a sudden, BAM! That bolt of lightning again. This is your call. And what are you gonna do? Well, I just shut the magazine, laid it down on my desk and said, okay Lord, if that's my call, Vivian has to hear it too. It's good to, good to have a wife to depend on as your uh, fleece. Later on in the day, Vivian came in, 
to pick up my paycheck, if you must know, okay? She, she did that routinely because if she didn't, I could never remember to bring it home. And uh, so she came into the, the office and uh, she stopped to say hi. And I said, Viv, there's, there's a, uh, my alumni magazine is on my desk and there was an article on page, let's just say page 10, uh, page 10 that interested me. Um, would you take a look at it and tell me what you think? She said, sure. A couple hours later, she called and interrupted me at work. Now, she never did that, okay? Vivian knew that how hard I was working, and she also valued what I was doing. But she called and interrupted me at work, and I knew this was significant. So I get on the phone. Yes, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she said, no, nothing's wrong, okay? I just read that ma that article that you you asked me to read, and Steve, this is right up your alley. We've got to look into this. Only then did I tell her the backstory of the question that I had asked her, and BAM! She didn't know what hit her, okay? Now, women, what do you do when your husband says, The Lord told me? Well, I'll tell you what my wife did. She immediately drew up a list of pros and cons and then sat me down on the couch when I got home and said, let's go over this carefully. And let me tell you, the cons, the disruption to our life, the challenges, the impossibilities, it took up a whole page. And over here on the pros, God told me. <laughs> but we had a good talk. And... Um, I added some things to her list of, of obstacles. You see, at the time, our hospital was the only hospital in like 13 counties where women who didn't have affluence could come for pregnancy care without being treated as second-class citizens or shown the door. There were five of us doctors here, and we were busy delivering babies. But I was the only one doing C-sections. It meant I was on call 24-7, but it also meant that the whole system rested on my ability and my, my services. If I stepped out, what would happen? What would happen to all these women that needed obstetrical care? And then there's, you know bad press. You see, uh, our community had a history of young doctors coming in fresh out of medical school, idealistic, enthusiastic, and four or five years later, exiting stage left, going on to greener pastures, bigger hospitals, bigger communities. And the community had kind of gotten a sour feeling in the pit of their stomach. It felt like rejection, and it was. So, me leaving, even after a decade, or more of being here, just perpetuated the story. And since I only felt called to go for one year, it would have been different if I'd, it was a permanent call, but I, I always assumed it would only be for one year. I was volunteering. Um, I meant I was coming back. And if I uh, turned the community against me, what was that going to do? Anyhow, there were all of these obstacles in the way. And um, the next thing Vivian did is she uh, pulled in reinforcements, okay? People that she knew I depended on for their opinions, their, our counselors. Uh, we have uh, had an accountant in town who had guided us wonderfully as we were building our business and building our family so we went and talked to him he was a good Christian man and he listened to my story and he said oh Steve Steve I mean if the Lord called you then you you need to go but you just built a, a clinic you just you just signed a, a mortgage for <laughs> more people more money than more most people even think about and now you're going to go to the bank and say, you know what, I'm going to take a year off. <laughs> we went to
went to church. Oh, boy, they were enthusiastic. Yes! Wait a minute. That means you're leaving? No, we don't want you to leave. We want you to be here. You know, you do this and you do that. You play the piano and, 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 and you teach Sabbath school. And Vivian, you do this. And more impossibilities. But they were supportive. I mean, after all, they, what else did they do? They're church folks. They, if the Lord said go, then go. So we went through this process of rationally assessing what was, you know, what would a rational person do in this situation? And common sense told us it was the chili. So we decided, no, this was an impossible dream. It was a nice thought, but no, not for us. So we went to church and told our friends. And one of my friends heard me explaining our rationale thought processes and he interrupted me and said Steve didn't I hear you say before that you thought the Lord called you to do this I said yeah he said do you remember Jonah how did that turn out <laughs> bam okay it was like a oh man so um Viv and I went and sat back down on the couch, okay? And it was a rough, a rough couple of weeks because, um, yeah, we even got our marit marital counselor involved, okay? We'd been through a rough spot uh, about a decade before, and uh, we had a marital counselor that we trusted, and we went to talk to him about Steve's call from God. We worked through all of that. Vivian agreed to come to me with come with me to Africa for one year and then we had to face the music okay I went to the bank president and told him what was going on and he kind of chuckled and looked at me condescendingly and said Steve I don't even know what you're talking to me about this for okay that clinic's so big down it's not one man. It's not a one-man show. It doesn't all rest on your shoulders. It's going to be fine without you. You just go. Wow. A little rough on the ego, but uh, impossibility number one, out the door. But then I had my partners that depended on me for C-section coverage. And, um, yeah, we had a sit-down together, a powwow, and uh, I told them, you know, i got to do this. And, they said, no, you don't. You can't do this. Uh, you're just leaving us in the lurch. You're leaving all of these women in the lurch, and you're abandoning them, and, and you can't do this, Steve. And I said, look, guys, most of you are Christians. What I'm telling you is I think the Lord told me to do this, and if I don't do it, I'm turning my back on him. Is that what you want me to do? Well, let me tell you, nobody said a word. The meeting broke up in absolute silence. The tension was so thick in the room you could have cut it with a knife. And one by one, they just stood up and walked out of the room. And I felt so defeated and helpless. And I didn't want to do this to my friends, but what else could I do? You know what? Through that day, every single one of them sought me out individually and said, Steve, we don't know how we're going to do this. But if the Lord called you, you're right. You've got to do it. We will survive somehow. Even the ones who weren't Christians, who weren't religious, came to me and said, Steve, they didn't say it in religious terms, but they basically gave me their support. It was amazing, you know? Well, we just kind of stewed on that. And two weeks later, without us advertising, talking it up on our social networks or professional networks or calling in recruiters. And OBGYN called us out of the blue and said, I want to come work for you. I heard about you. I want to come work for you. And it was like, bam, okay, you know, door open, impossibility gone. And that bad press I was worried about, the community reaction, well, Rotary asked me to give a presentation. That's how you know when you've arrived in a small town like this. Rotary asks you to give a presentation. 
And uh, at the end of it, the uh, editor of the local paper called me aside and said, Steve, I know you're going to be too busy over there to do this, but would your wife be interested in uh, writing some letters to the editor? We, you know, she could be like a foreign correspondence correspondent for us. Well, <laughs> that was right up my wife's alley. She loves writing and she loves communicating. And those of you that live here in Wayne County, well, you may remember from 20 years ago, her letters to the editors telling the stories from Africa. And it wasn't just the newspaper, okay? As soon as word got out that we were going as missionaries, churches started inviting us, asking us to tell our story of why we were going and what we were going to be doing. And uh, we gave presentations in like 20, 25 churches. And five of them, from four different denominations, prayed over us, laid hands on us, dedicated us as missionaries. They're missionaries. It was amazing. My family didn't go to Africa. An entire community went to Africa. It was... The doors just started opening, okay? In the Bible, there's this story here. As the Israelites are going into Canaan on the, at the end of the Exodus, they, they get to the border of the Canaan, and the border of Canaan is this river. And in the dry season, it's just a little rivulet. But in the spring, it's flooding. And the Lord says, cross over this flooded river. <laughs> so they take the priests, the religious people, the pastors and the teachers, okay, and they put them at the front of the column. And they say, okay, start walking. Walk into the water. And as their feet hit that muddy flood waters, all of a sudden the flood stops. And this path of dryish land appears across the river and the entire the entire crowd walks all across the river on dry land but the religious people had to put their feet in the water for it to happen that's what happened in our experience we put our feet in the water. We started moving forward even though we couldn't see the path through, even though it looked impossible, even though it looked like what we were doing was foolish and irrational. And the doors just started opening. But there was one nagging concern that I had. You see that spot on the map? That's not where we were going. The, the opportunity in that paper was actually in southern Nigeria, and the spot I had map, seen on the map was higher up, north central. And that just kind of kind of bothered me. I mean, the doors were opening and we were moving forward, but we were going to the wrong place. And then two weeks, two weeks before we were supposed to leave, I'd been preparing for this 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 hospital in the south. I'd been studying tropical medicine. I'd been learning the medications. I had books on frontier medicine, how to how to do surgeries when there's no surgeon and all of these things. And I'd even gotten books on the local language and was learning how to say hello like a kindergartner. Okay. And two weeks before we were supposed to hop on the airplane to go over there, I get this email. Steve, I hope you don't mind, but we really have a need up in north-central Nigeria. Would you be willing to let us change your location? <laughs> Two weeks! Talk about putting your feet in the water and the water's opening up at the last moment. Well, that, that year that my family spent in Nigeria transformed our lives, our children's lives. We had experiences that we'd never dreamed of. We made friends. Some of the, you that are watching this devotional are friends that we made in Nigeria that we will love forever. And when we came home, <laughs> we made friends here because 
We gave over 50 presentations in local churches the year after we came home, sharing our story of what, what had happened to us because we put our feet in the water. Now, if you're a religious person, all of this is like, oh, Steve got a call from the Lord. Hey, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, it's expected. It fits our belief system. It fits what we have been taught God does. He may not have done it in our lives, okay? He actually rarely does it, but he does it. If you're spiritual but not religious, stories like this are a little uncomfortable. You know, they, they, I know from my own experience when I was struggling with agnosticism, stories like this, you know, they confronted my worldview and, and didn't fit in the way I chose to look at the world. And that, that's a key word, chose. You see, each of us chooses the context within which we interpret the experiences that happen in our lives and the lives of others. Now, we take that choice and we buttress it up with facts. No, it's not a choice. You see, the facts say it. And we appeal to authorities, even the authority of the Bible. But when it really boils down to it, we made a choice. We made a choice. What authorities to accept, what facts to believe. And I think that is critical both in our relationship to spirituality, to God, and with each other. It's a choice. And I need to honor that choice in your life because you're finding your way through life the best you can, just like me. But there's a flip side to that. A choice narrows our possibilities. It, it decides which doors we're going to walk into and which doors we're not. It, it takes us down some paths and there are other paths. We never find out what would have happened if we'd walked down that path. There are consequences, results in our lives that happen because of choices. So while it's one thing to say, I need to honor your choice, it's a completely different thing to say, choice doesn't matter. I don't believe that a, a bit. Choice does matter. We just have to make the best choice we can. So today, if you're dealing with depression or anxiety, trauma, or you're still struggling with traumas that have happened in your past, I want to throw out another rope to you, okay? This is the third rope I'm throwing out here in the last couple weeks. First one was my ABBA experience. There's somebody out there who cares about you, somebody bigger than you. The second was my snake story. He's watching out for you. He's not just a father that's looking down on you. He actually tries to help. You're not alone. You will never be alone. And now today, if we will listen, he wants to guide us through life. We're not alone in finding our way. And those big decisions that make us feel so anxious, he's there. Now, he may not speak to you in an audible voice. He may not speak to you inaudibly, or give you conviction, okay? The fact is, okay, from my Christian context, he, he gave us the Bible. Cover to cover, it's object lessons, stories, guidance. Do this, don't do that. We rebel against it or we ignore it. We don't spend time in in um, studying it. <laughs> we let the pre preacher tell us what's in between the covers. We neglect it. So the rope that I want to throw out to you 
his guidance. Okay? He cares. He's trying to help. And he wants to guide in your life. That's the experience I've had in my life. Now, you can take it or leave it. It's my experience. But I just wanted to share that with you. And Donna, this happened before CHIP. Okay, this was in the year 2000, and we didn't start CHIP until I think it was 2004. Okay. Yep. So it, uh, yeah, it shaped the whole experience of CHIP for me. Yeah. And Betty, thank you for being my friend. I, I remember uh, in the workplace uh, the spiritual support that you gave. So, friends, that's all for this week. Thank you for, for spending time with me. And I, I look forward to next week, okay? Because I've got a story for you from Africa, and I love African stories. Take care.